Sveta wandered through a terrible blizzard and crackling frost, practically fainting from the cold and intense pain. Everything around her was so snowed in that she couldn't see a thing. A woman got off the bus a couple. She wanted to go to the supermarket and buy something for dinner. She didn't realize when the blizzard started. At first it just seemed to drizzle. But with each passing minute, the gusts of wind were even stronger. And the snow was whirling and blowing all around. And it was pouring down like a wall of snow. Sveta could barely get her on her feet and scolded herself. Stupid. Idiot. I have to give birth in two weeks. And in this, I had the nerve to go to the cemetery in this weather. Would I die? I won't make it. Oh, mummy, how it hurts. Ow, 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 ow. As luck would have it, my stomach and back started hurting like hell. It looked like I was going into labor. That's the last thing I don't need right now, she thought anxiously. The woman rummaged in her pockets for her phone to call an ambulance, and she didn't find it. Could it be that she forgot it at home? I have no brains at all. Her stomach was hurting more and more. She simply could not walk any further and her hands and feet were numb from the cold. Sveta tried to ask for help from passersby, but it was already dark outside and those rare people who, people she met on her way, pretended not to hear her and hurried away on their own. The woman crouched in great pain and after scrambling to the porch of the first doorway she found, she started to chaotically dial the combination of numbers, now and then getting into one apartment and then another. She begged and literally screamed with all her might. Help. Call an ambulance. Open the door, please. I'm sick. I'm in labor. In one of the apartments, though, a man answered at the beginning. I'll get it. Wait. But then came the shrieking of his wife. Don't you dare. Don't we have enough problems in life? Normal people stay at home in this weather, especially pregnant ones. Let someone else take care of her. Clearly a beggar or a ragamuffin what? Sveta cried in despair. What a time. What kind of people are so cruel? Is it so hard to call an ambulance and open the door so that the person does not freeze to death? She was already. She could feel neither her arms nor her legs, only painful piercing contractions that burned like hot iron. Her legs were shaky and unsteady, and the woman dialed the number 46 one last time in despair. She whispered with cracked, dry lips, I beg you, open the door. I am dying. She no longer hoped that anyone would answer, just sat down on the porch, unable to stand on her feet, and prepared to die a long and painful death. Suddenly, a miracle happened, and a dry, gray-haired, elderly man came out on the doorstep. He was wearing a jacket hastily thrown over his shoulders, with only a light shirt underneath. When he saw the pregnant woman in her thin coat and shabby boots, clearly not intended for this kind of weather, he gasped and rushed to her. Woman, what's wrong with us? I'll call an ambulance. Come on, I'll help you at least to enter the doorway. Otherwise you can get frostbite. But who, in your condition walks in such a cold? Young people, what are they thinking about? Sveta had no time to answer at all, only looked at her savior with eyes full of tears and gratitude, and cried out again from the strongest painful contractions and lost. Unconscious, Fedor immediately assessed the situation as critical. The woman was clearly in labor. He, he called an ambulance, even though he knew it would take a long time to get there in this. Snowstorm and on unpaved roads, the man spent a long, confused time explaining to the dispatcher who was in labor and why it was happening in his, his apartment, but there was no way he could have waited any longer. So he began dragging the woman back to his apartment. Thank God, she was on the first floor. It was the first floor. He spread a blanket on the floor in the hallway, put the laboring mother down, and started to give her to her nose, trying to bring her to her senses. She finally came to and she cried out at once. Thank you. Don't think I'm a beggar. I'm not a beggar. I just wanted to visit my dead fiancé today. To visit the cemetery. It's his birthday today, you know. 
Well, I could not go, and I went by my own feet. I also left my phone at home. I know I'm an idiot, and I should have stayed home. In this weather, my name is Sveta. Actually, I'm still too early to give birth. My due date is in two weeks. But I'm not sure I'm ready yet, but I've got something on my chest. Oh, again, mommy, it hurts so bad. What should I do? Did you call an ambulance? And she crouched down again, biting her lips and trying to endure the searing pain. The man ran to find alcohol, sheets, poured into a basin of warm water and commanded. So, Sveta, listen to me carefully. My name is Fedor. I called an ambulance, but because of the snowstorm, it will probably take about an hour, and your contractions are getting more and more frequent, which by all that means you're in full labor. Don't ask anything. Just trust me and do what I tell you to do. When the contraction starts, you have to breathe through your nose when I tell you to. And push, okay? I'm going to clean my hands and see where the baby's head is. Okay, okay, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. On the contrary, I want to help you give birth to a healthy baby. Try to help me too. Are you having a normal pregnancy? Are you registered? Is the fetus positioned correctly? It's important. Try to remember. And don't. Don't panic. We don't need hysteria. Okay, it started, right? Repeat after me. Inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. Sveta wanted to argue that she was scared and she did not know the man. And anything could happen now. But the contractions really began to become more frequent and painful. She stopped to understand anything at all. She was drenched in cold sweat and as in a fog tried to carry out the man's commands. And the man acted like a true professional. And in half an hour an admirable baby boy was born. Exhausted. But happy Sveta watched as Fedor deftly washed and patted him on the bottom. The boy immediately cried out, so high-pitched and loud that his ears popped. The man swaddled the baby expertly and put it in Sveta's hands. Try to feed him. Don't be shy. You may not have milk yet, but it's very important that it appears. Sveta was crying with happiness. She obediently did everything. Her son was really smacking his lips laughingly and tried to suckle. At last, the ambulance arrived. The young paramedic apologized for taking so long. They had, they had barely made it to the outskirts of town. He was astonished to learn that an ordinary senior citizen had delivered a baby so professionally. He was astonished to find out that an ordinary senior citizen had given birth in such a professional manner, and not in the conditions of a maternity ward, which has everything you need, but at home, with nothing. Not every experienced obstetrician is capable of that. He started shaking his hand. I am shocked. You are a real hero. You saved a woman in the freezing cold and delivered her baby at home. And delivered her at home. Yes, you should write about you in the newspaper. I cannot believe that you have nothing to do with medicine. Fedor blushed. He was pleased with this praise and just waved his hand. Yes, it's a long story. I do not want to rake up the past. I'm just a security guard in a supermarket, that's all. The chauffeur, who had entered the apartment at the request of the paramedic, to carry the woman in labor on a gurney and take her to the maternity hospital, heard a fragment of this conversation, took a glimpse of the hero, and was taken aback. Wait a minute, that's the famous cardiac surgeon, Fader Zvonkov, to him for operations recorded six months in advance. The driver jumped up to the pensioner and warmly hugged him. Your Zvonkov, Fedor, cardiac surgeon, right? You at one time, my niece, Alice, literally saved his life a valve on the heart. You changed her heart valve. She still remembers you, the jerk. What are you? Pardon me, a guard. Where did you disappear so? So unexpectedly. What a meeting. So you know how to deliver a baby. Respect and honor to you. Man even more embarrassed. Oh, come on. All about me to me. Svetashka there. Better help. 
because, frankly, it was the first time I delivered a baby in my life. You never know. With a fright, I remembered everything I learned at the university. At the university. Let her gynecologist look at it. But for the kind words, thank you. I am very pleased. The woman and baby were taken away to the hospital. She parted firmly, squeezed his withered little palm, and whispered with gratitude. Thank you. You are my guardian angel, my savior. I will name my son after you, Fedia. If it were not for your kind heart, I would have frozen to death. I thought there weren't such kind people left. I thought there weren't any more. I'm sorry to have come down on you like a snowball. So much. Trouble because of me. Fedor suddenly got worried. Listen, I'm an idiot. At least tell me your last name. You have to bring everything you need to the hospital, don't you? How will you be there without anything? Sveta mouthed. My name is Osipova. Here, the key to my room. In the dormitory there is a large bag, in it all collected, and for me and the child, bring it to me, if it's not too much trouble, tomorrow. Thanks again for everything. And she dictated her address, explaining the best way to get there. Then she cradled her son gently, and they took her to the maternity hospital. And Fedor cleaned everything in the apartment, and began to go over his past, and he was so bitter his heart ached. Just ten years ago, Fedor Zvonkov was a famous cardiac surgeon. He operated in the most prestigious hospitals in the capital, had a wife, Lena, and a son, Vanya. My wife worked. The wife worked with him in the department as an anesthesiologist, and she was also loved and respected for her professionalism. They had met many years ago, when they were medical students, and they never parted. Fedia did not know how to make beautiful confessions. He was a very shy and modest young man. Although he fell in love with Lena, the perky chuckler and jolly girl from the parallel stream, immediately, he swooned over her smile, laughter, the look in her brown eyes. He stared at her furtively and silently for a long time, and then he could not stand it. I waited for her after the lectures, just took her hand and her bag in the other, and said, Whatever you want, Lenka, but I love you. Will you come with me? The girl was taken aback and asked again, Where will I go? Is this a joke? But Fader answered more than seriously, Will you go to the registry office? Tomorrow we'll get married. Right tomorrow. We have a couple of months before graduation. I'm already working. With me you won't get lost. Do you believe me? And he gave her that look that she just believed him. And they did go. And they got married. And they never separated again. Lived soul to soul. And did not even quarrel. When Vanya was born, there was no limit to their happiness. He was their beloved late baby, child. The boy grew up in love and prosperity, went to a prestigious private school and showed great hopes. When he graduated from high school, he went to university to study economics. Life seemed long ago, had been settled. Everything was going on as it should, in its own way. That fateful, blackest day. In Fader's life, crossed out his whole destiny ruined it, turned it into a draft. The whole family was resting in a country sanatorium. They often went there. Fyodor and son liked to go fishing in the lake in silence, and Lena enjoyed swimming and sunbathing. I, It just so happened. On that unfortunate day, he was called to work urgently. A very serious patient was brought in. His life had to be saved. His relatives understood everything and let him go with a his relatives understood what he was going through and let him go with a light heart. But at midnight Fyodor received. It was in their house that the wiring snapped and his wife and son died in the fire. This. An unbelievably horrible and monstrous death. Fader's colleagues helped him bury his loved ones. He was completely insane and refused to believe that Lena and Vanya were gone. Even at the... No. It's not Lena. Are you kidding me? And Vanya, is this disfigured body can be my son. It's just a mistake. The staff at first felt sorry for him, gave him time off to recuperate. 
it was clear he couldn't operate in such a condition. And for nothing. Fader kept getting up at dawn, preparing oatmeal for Len's breakfast and sandwiches, with ham sandwiches for Vanya, talking to them as if they were there. Then went to warm up the car, informing Lesha, telling his neighbor that he was already late for work and that he had to take his wife to the store and his son to the university. Then the neighbor, unable to endure this picture, finally echoed the surgeon that there is no wife and son. No wife and son at all, and never will be. During this activity they drank a bottle of alcohol, and after Fedor could no longer, could not stop, only drunk as hell could he forget himself for a few hours with a restless sleep. And when he woke up, he would run back to the supermarket for a bottle to numb the terrible pain. That was killing him. The longing for his wife and son was so strong that he would to dig a grave and lie down next to them, to die, just to be there, in the other world with his own. So imperceptibly, the once famous heart surgeon sank to the bottom. There was no one to help support, give him a friendly shoulder. From work, he paid himself, first of all, his hands were shaking, and secondly, he just physically. He couldn't bear sympathetic glances and gossip. He had given up drinking a year ago, and, as abruptly and in one day as he had begun, in a drunken stupor, Fedor had a strange dream. Lena was looking at him severely, holding the hand of somehow very young Vanya, and reprimanded him like a schoolboy. What are you doing, Fedia? I didn't marry such a weakling. I didn't marry such a weakling. Stop it at once. Who do you look like now? The low-life bum. By God. And remember, you have someone to live for. You just don't know it yet. At the same time, Vanya was crying and begging. Daddy, don't drink, please. I beg you. Please don't. The man woke up in a cold sweat and jumped up on the bed like he was scalded. The terrible hangover was gone and the hangover was gone. His head suddenly became clear, and for the first time since his wife's death, he looked around. What he saw, he was shocked. Dust everywhere, dirt, mountains of dried and unwashed dishes. He had even. The crystal service, he had drunkenly got to it. The apartment was a pigsty. And in Lena's time, everything here was shining and sparkling. How did he come to live like this? It's unbelievable. He looked apprehensively at himself in the mirror and even recoiled. From there, he looked at him overgrown old alcoholic with bags under his eyes and wrinkles. Where had the gloss gone? He crossed himself and lifted his head up and whispered, Thank you, honey. I got it. Not a drop more. Since that day, Fyodor had never had another drop of alcohol. The neighbor, the one with whom he had started his drinking spree, was shocked. How could that be? What willpower? And Fader began to clear away the rubble and put the apartment in order. It took him almost three weeks of titanic labor. He took out mountains of empty bottles and turned them in. He spent a lot of time cleaning the place and making it tidy. Finally, when everything was as shiny and shiny as it had been when his wife was alive, he settled down. Then the man took care of himself, bought new, neat clothes, got a haircut, shaved and even got a, a job at a supermarket as a security guard. He worked hard and his colleagues respected him, the, so as not to go crazy on weekends at home from boredom and loneliness, he got a kitten and named it Chernish. The pet was just a charm, he was black, and on the neck as if someone has tied a white tie. Too. He was so cute. The man loved to sit in an armchair, dozing and stroking the silky pleasant coat. Pet. His steady purring soothed and somehow calmed Fyodor. And so he lived, almost a recluse, in his apartment. The man no longer hoped for anything, just lived out his life. His health had taken a serious turn for the worse, with a distressing diagnosis at the clinic and Fyodor hoped that he would finally meet his wife and son in the other world. But today's incident suddenly broke into a whirlwind of his boring, lonely life and turned it upside down. After Sveta was taken to the maternity hospital, Fader, 
got up early in the morning and rushed to her dormitory to pick up a bag of things for her and the baby. Even at the entrance, the awful smell of alcohol, cigarettes, and fried cheap fish knocked him off his feet. On seeing him, an unpleasant-looking older woman, whose face clearly showed traces of a turbulent life, sneeringly remarked, Wow, our orphan what? Has she turned to old men, or has she found her father? And she laughed loudly and shrill. Pensioner looked at her reproachfully. Shame on you, Sveta in maternity hospital. Here, she asked me to give her a bag. Is it possible so about people? You're a woman too. The neighbor immediately became serious. Oh, sorry, I did not know. Just kidding. It's a bit early, isn't it? Wait, give her this for me. And she handed the old man two apples. Say so, from Lidka. She'll understand. Sveta's a good woman, but she's unlucky. Although, you know, the lucky ones don't live here. When he entered the miserable cold room and looked around, he was horrified. The old windows were blowing mercilessly, even though the woman had caulked them up with absorbent cotton and scotch tape, and the door was flimsy, hanging on by a thread, and you could hear everything from the hallway. The room was very clean and tidy. All the things and books in their places, the pensioner took a quick look at the bag, and it was not dense there either. Only the bare necessities for the baby were there, and they had obviously been sewn by himself. In the center of the table, in a black frame, stood the portrait of a young handsome boy. Next to him stood a glass of vodka and black bread on top. It turns out that not long ago in this poor woman's life had had some tragedy in her life too. She did say something about why she was in the cemetery. After locking the door, the pensioner determinedly went to the store and bought diapers, bottles and some clothes for the baby and a new winter jacket for her and in overalls for the newborn in a beautiful blue color. He begged the nurse by slipping her a chocolate bar, and she let him into Sveta's room for a while, especially since she was there alone. The woman was very happy to see the old man and began to hug him as if he were a friend or close. Relative. Hello, Fedor. Thank you for everything. Again. Oh, how nice of you to come. Otherwise, I'd get bored here with Fedia. I've got him. He's so calm. He sleeps and eats according to schedule. Just a miracle, not a baby. The man felt sorry for me. Did you really name your son Fyodor? You respected the old man. Very nice. Let me have a look at the boy. Oh, he's chubby. He's so handsome. How are you? How's your health? Are you going home soon? Sveta mouthed. Everything is fine. The doctor said that the birth was a real professional, but scolded me, of course, for carelessness. I was really stupid. I went to the cemetery in that position. I just feel so bad and nauseous without Oleg. Just my heart is torn to him. I would have lived there, in that cemetery, just to be near him. And she suddenly burst into tears, childishly. The tears rolled down her cheeks in large drops. She shuddered her skinny body. Fedor felt unbearably sorry for her. He sat on the edge of her bed, gently took her hand, and began to whisper, I understand you, my daughter, as no one. Believe me, I lost my wife and son myself. I drank a lot. I hit rock bottom. I barely made it. I know how it hurts and hurts inside. I want to howl and scream beat the walls with my fists and beg, and beg the heavens to have mercy on you and bring your dear one back. You speak out, it will be easier. Sveta again looked at him gratefully and quietly began to tell. You see, I am an orphan, grew up in an orphanage, what just have not suffered for all these years. All those years, you wouldn't wish it on anyone. I was locked in a storeroom, teased and malnourished. It's been so many years and I still can't eat bread. When I see someone throwing it in the trash, my heart bleeds. When I finished, I was given that miserable little room. They didn't have any relatives they knew. They knew I wouldn't complain and who would listen to an orphan. I tried, of course, 
at least to repaper and paint the floor. But you saw for yourselves, they need a complete overhaul. And I won't even say a word about the common areas. Quiet horror. You can't wait for the ceiling to fall on your head. I went to school to become a seamstress. I graduated with honors. I was already working part-time, taking home. Small orders from people. I got help from all over the world. Neighbors, classmates chipped in and bought a sewing machine for my birthday. For my birthday, a sewing machine. That's how I met my Oleg. He brought me pants to him. One word at a time. One thing led to another. We got to talking. We liked each other. We started dating. My fiancé was a construction worker. A construction worker. He was paid well, so we rented an apartment. He wouldn't agree to live in mine. There really are no human conditions there. Everything was so wonderful. We loved each other, just without memory. Even though we're both hot-tempered, we're not vindictive. Right away we hugged and kissed, and there was no resentment. And there's no resentment, no resentment at all. And what poems he wrote me himself. He'd get up at night while I was asleep, write it, and in the morning, he'd put it on my pillow for me to read. It was so pleasant. We filed a registry office application. Olszyk was also. He was all alone. His grandmother brought him up. She died a long time ago. We decided not to. Celebrate the wedding. We decided not to have a wedding, just a modest wedding. And then I started vomiting in the morning. I went to the doctor and found out that I was pregnant. I was very worried how I should tell my fiancé that it might be too early. We somehow have not discussed this question yet. We thought we would live a little for ourselves and then have children. But Oleg was so happy, he really wanted a baby. We started saving every penny so that the birth and a stroller and a good crib and a nice crib. But my fiancé spoiled me, bought me bananas and oranges. No one ever took care of me ever cared for me like that. Like he did. He cared if I was eating well, so the baby would get his vitamins. And that day I was just finishing sewing a dress for a customer when the phone rang. When they told me that Oleg was gone, I just could not believe it. How is it no more? There was a man. And no. It turns out there was an accident at the construction site. Oleg plummeted from the tenth floor. And so my life was over. For good. All the money went to the funeral. I spent my fiance in the last. The last journey. As it should be. And then started a living hell. I couldn't pay the rent. I had to move into my. It's cold there. I have to wear three socks. Hands dropping all thought. Cried. Who needs my baby now? Oleg is gone. He will never see his son. He will not be able to love. And... He will never be able to love him or raise him. Would I be able to raise a child on my own? And my heart just tore at my beloved. I couldn't forget him. I can't forget him. I miss him terribly. It was only when you gave Fadia to me in your arms that my heart finally warmed up. I feed him, and it feels so good, my little bundle of joy. But still, it's very scary to be alone with a baby. Sometimes panic sets in. To be honest, I don't even know how to take care of him. I don't even know how to take care of him. What did they teach us at the orphanage? Fyodor listened with tears in his eyes of that poor woman, and he almost cried himself to tears. So similar is their condition after the death of their loved ones. But he, an adult, established in life and profession man, took and broke down. A this young woman, left alone with a black grief, took this battle, not dropped her hands. He was touched and said firmly, you know what, Sveta, I have a proposition for you. I'll take you and the baby to my place after discharge. What do you need there in the cold to crawl? You think it over. How and where to bathe the baby there? It's drafty all around. He's bound to get sick. And I've got a big three bedroom, plenty of room for everybody. You already know me. I'm the closest thing we've ever had to getting to know each other. I'm a simple, non-confrontational person. I think we'll become friends. It's good for you. And I don't get bored. 
I'll help you with the baby. And my cat, Chernish, will be happy. Well, do you agree? Sveta cried again and cried out. Oh, thank you, Fedor. I'm terribly embarrassed to have fallen on your head with my problems, but I think I'll take your offer and live at least for the first time. I'm really worried about my son. There's no way he's going to, not a life. I've been sick three times. I don't know how to thank you. You're just a golden man. After the man left, Sveta began to disassemble the bag and almost cried again. There was so much, all the things she needed. It's all finished, Fedor. What a good man. After all, she is, in fact, a complete stranger. A complete stranger to him. Why was he so concerned about her? For her, who had grown up in an orphanage and had never known, or tenderness, was so wild such a manifestation of simple human participation in her fate. And even if she did not understand the motives of such nobility, she was very pleased. And so they all began to live together. Sveta, little Fedia, Fedor, and the cat Chernish. The woman at first felt shy and awkward every time she asked if she could take this or that. But soon everything fell into place and she felt so cozy and comfortable in. She felt that she and Fyodor had known each other for a hundred years. He gladly helped her to take care of the baby and taught her a lot as a medical man. Sveta fed the old man with delicious borscht and meatballs and sometimes pampered him with cakes. The cat Chernish liked to lie down at the baby's feet and purr and cradle him in his own way. The only thing that really bothered her was that her savior often had a bad headache. She measured the pressure, a little high, but not critical for his age. The woman often secretly watched him, trying not to show his pain, clenching his fists so that his knuckles turned white, drinking handfuls of the strongest painkillers. But when she tried to ask Fyodor directly what was wrong with him, or suggested that he see a doctor, he just waved. Don't worry about it. It's all nonsense. At my age, if you wake up and nothing hurts, then you're already dead. It's all in the change of weather. But the woman knew he was just a distraction. He really does not want to tell the truth. She hoped that he would later reveal himself and tell everything. She did not want to pry into the soul of a man by force. One day Sveta started a general cleaning. And Fedor, not to interfere, volunteered to take Fedia Jr. for a walk. He affectionately called him Granson. When the man returned, an hour and a half later, he found Sveta looking at the portrait in amazement. She asked in surprise, Where did you get this photo? I know this guy. Is he a relative of yours? Fedor almost cried. Yes, honey. It's my son Vanya. May he rest in peace. I put all the pictures of him and his wife in the closet on purpose. Not. I still can't look at them without tears. My heart hurts. How much time has passed, and I still blame myself for, for that fire. I blame myself for leaving, for not being there. Maybe things would have been different, and I could have saved my family. Or, I would have burned with them. We'd all be in heaven together. And now I'm stuck here alone. Sveta waved her hands. No way. That's Dennis, my dead fiance's friend. He's a paratrooper. They served together. He was at the funeral, too. And before that, he sometimes came to visit us. I'm not out of my mind yet. How is that possible? I don't get it. Do I? The old man thought hard, remembering something, then said, You know, Svetochka, Actually, my wife gave birth to twins, but when she came to herself after complicated birth, she was told the terrible news that one of the babies was stillborn. We, of course, we grieved, buried our son in the cemetery, everything as it should be. There could be no mistake. I personally handled the funeral. My wife couldn't stand it. She was crying so much. She even lost her milk on nerves and had to feed Vanya with formula. I want to find this Dennis. You said you have a picture of him. Will you show me tomorrow? Do you know where he lives? Sveta enthusiastically took to helping Fyodor. It was a mystery that kept her busy. 
She wanted to quickly find out and understand how this was possible. That two complete strangers to each other were like two peas in a pod. After all, such miracles simply did not happen. The woman went home and brought back the very picture of Dennis and her late fiancé, Oleg. The old man looked at it for a long time, compared it to the portrait of his son, and was amazed. You're right, just like copying. I thought, you were exaggerating. Really just look alike. I have never seen that. How are we supposed to know where, where he lives? I just can't wait to talk to him and find out everything. Who is he? What family did he grow up in? Sveta had no trouble finding out Dennis' phone number through mutual acquaintances because he lived in their own city. City. The very next day she called him and asked to meet. He knew Sveta. He and Oleg were best friends in the army, and of course he agreed to come. He thought maybe the woman needed some help, and he couldn't help but respond. When Dennis arrived, at Sveta's address he was surprised to see. Hello, Svetochka. He was quite surprised to see a woman with a baby in her arms and an old man. Ho, oh, is this your little boy? Sorry, I did not know that you were pregnant when Oleg was gone. This is Oleg's son, right? The woman tried to explain. Hello, Dennis. Yes, this is Fedia, Oleg's son. You're right. Well, I wasn't old enough at the time, and I didn't have time for that. I'd lost the man I loved. I'd barely made it, so not many people know about it. But it's not about my son. I'd like you to meet him. This is Fedor. He's a famous surgeon and a very good man. He's going to tell you why he wanted to see you. Dennis was confused. Good afternoon, I'm Dennis, nice to meet you. But I can't for the life of me remember, do we know each other? The old man waved his hands. No, Dennis, we don't know each other personally. But it just so happens that Sveta saw a picture of my dead son Vanya and started claiming that it wasn't Vanya at all, but her acquaintance Dennis. Here, take a look for yourself. What do you think? The young man could not understand anything yet, but when he looked at the portrait, he lost his breath. He was looking at him, just like him, only his hair was different, longer hair and a slanted, the parting, but he looked the same. You couldn't tell the difference. He didn't understand anything, so he began to tell me about himself. I don't know how it's possible. I was brought up by my mother alone, without my father. But in another city, a hundred kilometers away, I am definitely not adopted. I have seen the birth certificate a hundred times. It's true. We had no father or other relatives, so we lived with my mom alone until she died, unfortunately, six months ago. It still hurts to talk about it. She was the best. She loved me very much, always pitied me. My mother's name is Nikiforova Alexandra Mafievna. Maybe you know her. Know her somehow, but I don't know anything about it. She worked all her life as a kindergarten teacher. The old man shook his head disappointedly. No, I do not know such a person. I still have an excellent memory for the names. You see, my wife gave birth to twins, and she was told that one child had died. We mourned him and buried him. Something doesn't add up. How do we find out and solve this mystery of similarity, especially since your mother, Dennis, is no longer alive and neither is my wife. Some kind of a deadlock is developing. Dennis thought for a while, then suddenly exclaimed, Listen, so you can go to a private detective agency. Maybe they can help find a clue. The old man suddenly perked up. That's right, I'm an old fool. No brains at all. I've got a good friend. I once saved his life on the operating table. I remembered he gave me his card. He said, I'll solve any problem. I don't throw things like that away, just in case they come in handy. If he hasn't quit and retired yet, he will definitely help. A very good investigator, Pavel Zbruv. He used to solve such high-profile and complicated cases, not like ours. I will try to call him and arrange it. So we decided. Then we all had tea. 
Dennis asked me to say goodbye. Can I hold Fadia in my arms? After all, he's not. He's not a stranger, he's Oleg's son. Sveta smiled and nodded her head in agreement. She really liked Dennis. As a man who was always calm and judicious, but very shy and taciturn. He reverently took the baby, who smiled with his toothless mouth so comically, and he grunted, feeling that someone else had taken him in. Dennis laughed. Oh, look, such a small and already made a face at me, just like Oleg in childhood. Well, just hilarious. He's so funny. And it looks like that. It's a pity Oleg did not live to see this moment. He would have been happy. Because you, Sveta, my friend loved you very much. That I know for a fact. As agreed, Fedor actually found the investigator's business card and asked to see him. The man was pleased and agreed, invited the former surgeon to a cafe. The old acquaintances embraced in a friendly manner. Paul exclaimed, Good afternoon, Fedor. How many years, how many winters? Very glad to see you. Don't think. I haven't forgotten. Thanks to whom my engine is beating. Thank you. You saved my life back then. I take it something happened, and now you need help. I'd be happy to help you, especially since I'm long retired. I have my own detective agency. Well, I can't do without a search. As my wife says, the case is clinical and cannot be treated. Fedor took out a portrait of his son and Dennis and put it on the table. Here, look, this picture is of my dead son, Ivan. And this one is a complete stranger to me, Dennis. I met him, we talked. He was brought up by his mother in a neighboring town. Nothing in common, I guess, but you can see that the resemblance is phenomenal. My wife had twins at one time, but one of the children died and we buried him properly. As it should be, only Vanya survived. Can you help me solve this mystery, my friend? I would be very grateful. Paul splashed his hands. Well, you are like children, honestly. The first thing you need to start is to give samples for genetic testing you and Dennis. That way we will know for sure if you are relatives or not. In the meantime, I'm gonna go through the archives of the maternity hospital and its staff. See what I can find. We'll be in touch. Believe me, there's no such thing as miracles. There's a logical explanation. I'll do my best to help you, Fedor. Don't doubt it. The old man called Dennis and offered to do a genetic analysis. He was very surprised, but agreed. Of course, I do not think that we are in any way related. I certainly think we cannot be related, but the mystery of similarity with your son, frankly, does not give me peace. So let's dispel all doubts already. I don't mind. I went through all the old papers and documents at home. No certificates or other evidence that, that I'm not my mother's real son, I couldn't find any. But it doesn't work like that either. I looked at all the pictures of mom and my late grandparents, and I look a little bit like them. Well, let's see what the experts say. When the results came back, absolutely everyone was shocked. It turned out that Fyodor and Dennis were actually father and son. It was just unbelievable, and everything became even more confusing and incomprehensible. How on earth had happened? Who then had Fedor buried instead of his stillborn son? What the hell had happened? All these years to have a native son and not know about it. Three weeks later, Pavel called and invited everyone to his agency. Dennis went, too. He, just burning with curiosity and wanted to know the truth, whatever it was, the investigator seated everyone and began his report. I found out everything, guys. I can't say it was easy, because both women in labor, the subjects of this tangled story, had already died. But I managed to find the very midwife who delivered both women that night. Her name was Klamova Ekaterina Semyonovna. Well, the woman was stubborn at first, and she didn't want to talk. She even hung up on me. It seemed to me that this is more than strange. Because if a person has nothing to hide, why is she so nervous? Then I found a nurse, fortunately, still alive and well, 
though very old, and she hinted to me that that night there had been. The nurse accidentally overheard a fragment of a conversation, but did not tell me anything else either. She was afraid. Then I pressed the midwife. There are his methods. She confessed to everything. It turns out that Klamova Ekaterina and your mother Dennis were best friends. That is why your mother went to give birth in this very maternity hospital, and not according to the registration, as it should be. At first everything went well. In spite of the difficult birth, and the woman's forty years old, the baby still came into the world, albeit with a weak heart. But a few hours later, disaster struck. During a routine round of the adaptation room, Catherine noticed the lifeless body of a baby. It was just her friend's newborn. Upon learning of this, your mother, Dennis, began sobbing and begging for help. After all, the doctors in her critical age and health condition warned her right away that she would never be able to have children again. That day next to her, your wife, Fedor, gave birth to two healthy boys. The midwife at first refused. She would not agree, understanding that this was a criminal offense, and if anything, she would go to jail for a long time. But my friend cried so hard and promised her a lot of money for that time. The heart. She was very sick at the time and needed money right away. The situation was a surprisingly good one for the midwife. The June holiday of the day of the Surgeon General that night. The day of the doctor's day in June that night brought all the doctors and nurses on duty in the nursing room. No one even noticed Ekaterina Semyonovna, who had been absent for a short time. That is how she managed to change the children and rewrite. The tags on the pens. No one suspected a thing. It happens. That's all. You, Fyodor, were given a dead child and your twin son, alive and well, was given to someone else's woman. All the records made it look as if one of the twins had died. Those were different times, no one. You were grief-stricken and didn't bother to find out the truth. Although hot on the trail, you could certainly quickly untwist the case. After all, Vanya survived, which means life goes on. That's how that midwife got away with it. Your mother, Dennis, is understandable is humanly understandable. She was desperate and clung to any straw. But the midwife, who committed such a crime, I can't justify it. I can't justify a midwife who would do such a thing. With other people's lives, who gave her that right? Destroying other people's lives and destinies. The hair on my head. The hair on my head when I heard that. It's crazy. Well, things happen, but you can adopt. How many of them are in orphanages, the poor ones? Why steal someone else's child? I, if it were just some unfortunate woman who had given birth and didn't want any children. But now, knowing what long awaited, your wife's long awaited children, Fedor, it's unbelievable to do such a mean thing. Dinas sat there in complete shock. His head was jumbled with a thousand thoughts. It turned out, all this time he had been living someone else's life, not his own. Someone had rewritten his fate for him back in the maternity hospital, and he was raised by a woman who was completely alien to him, and he sincerely loved her and called her his mother. But he could have had a completely different life, with a twin brother and blood parents who were perfectly normal people. He looked at Fyodor very differently now. I looked into every line of his face and looked for similar native features, and he found them. The boy suddenly thought, God, if it hadn't been for Sveta, if it hadn't been for her completely accidental acquaintance, Fyodor, he, Dennis, would have gone on living like that, thinking that he no longer had any relatives on this earth. No more relatives on this earth. But it turns out that he and his own father live in the same city, walk the same streets, and are completely unaware of each other's existence. In a burst of emotion, he walked up to the old man and for the first time hugged him warmly and truly sincerely. Hello, Daddy. I'm glad we found each other. We have a lot. We have a lot to talk about and a lot to catch up on in our relationship, but I know the main thing. We are together now. And I won't leave you, 
no matter what happens. Fedor even cried. He was so nervous. Suddenly, a severe headache. Suddenly, a severe headache came into his eyes, and he lost consciousness and collapsed on the floor. Paul and Dennis were terribly frightened, called an ambulance, and began to try to bring the old man to his senses, splashing cold water on him. Finally, little by little, Fader began to. Fyodor started to regain consciousness. He felt a little better. Dennis began to ask him questions. What's the matter with you, Dad? Do you often feel so bad? The elderly man sighed and confessed. Well, to be honest, six months ago, they found an aneurysm of cerebral vessels. I couldn't understand why I had such severe headaches. No pills helped. My vision started falling, double vision, often nauseated. And when I learned my diagnosis, I gave up on everything. The only thing that could help was surgery. Otherwise, the tumor would just burst, hemorrhage into the brain and die. Surgery costs insane amounts of money. I never had and never will. And who needs me? The sooner I die, the sooner I'll meet Lena and Vanya in the afterlife. The only thing is that the attacks became more and more frequent, more and more often, especially if I get nervous. I hope I don't have long to suffer. Dinas ran up to the old man and hugged him. What are you talking about, Daddy? I need you. Sveta needs you. I've only just found my own father, and you say it won't be long now. I'll find out everything. I'll take you. And I'll take you to a doctor, and we'll fix you. I want you to have an operation, and get better. For my sake. Do you hear? That same day, Dennis went for a walk with Sveta, and the baby in the park, and began to tell her everything. Did you know that Fitter is terminally ill? Why didn't you tell me? It turns out he needs an expensive emergency surgery. He fainted today in a private detective's office. Can you imagine? And he is also my own father. Sveta was shocked by what she heard. Actually, he often takes some pills and complained of headaches. But how many times I did not ask him. He kept silent, apparently. He didn't want to upset him. We have to help him. There's no one else. He's a wonderful man. My son and I owe our lives to this holy man. Now I understand why Fitter decided to leave his apartment to me. What should we do, Dennis? Why don't we take out a loan? We could try to sell my shabby room, but it wouldn't fetch much. For it, of course. And I don't have anything else. The guy thought about it. And then he answered, I'll sell the car, that should be enough. I'll do it tomorrow. I don't need that pile of iron. When a man's life is at stake. In the meantime, find a clinic and a good surgeon. Time is of the essence, and time is of the essence. I just found my own father, and I cannot let anything happen to him. The young people got actively involved, and within three weeks everything was ready, and Fader was. Three weeks later everything was ready and Fader was admitted to the ward for surgery. Everyone was very worried. Dennis and Sveta took turns being on duty. Everyone was very worried. And Dennis and Sveta took turns being at the hospital and sitting with Fedia the younger. During this time, the boy became so attached to the baby, just with his heart and soul. With his soul, he learned how to bathe and feed him, cradle and play with him. Fedia always smiled at him and very rarely, and very seldom did he get naughty. Dennis often caught himself thinking that he could no longer imagine his life without Sveta, Fedia, and Daddy. What did he have before that? Work, friends, and loneliness. In an empty rented apartment, there were, of course, girls, he was a good-looking guy. But no matter how many times, Dennis tried to start a serious relationship. It didn't work. It just didn't click. He didn't get the feeling inside that that was it. Mine for life. He was not interested in short flings. He wanted a long and serious relationship. But all of them were calculating girls. If you buy an expensive gift, take her to a cafe. She's yours. If it's just tea in the kitchen, then sorry, goodbye. Now he often watched how this seemingly ordinary, unremarkable woman cleverly cooks dinner babysits the baby, 
and involuntarily admired her. For some reason, my heart was beating very often. He wanted to hug her, hold her, touch her, kiss her, but he always told himself not to. Don't you dare, she's almost your best friend's wife. How will it look if we get close to her? What if she gets offended or misunderstands? Sveta often thought about Dennis too. She compared him with Oleg and listened to herself. They were completely different. Oleg was so emotional. Open, his emotions were written all over his face, and Dennis was silent, always thinking about something and looking at her strangely. But why was she attracted to him? As if by a magnet. She was even a little ashamed. It seemed that she betrayed the memory of her fiancé, thinking all the time about another man. But the more Sveta tried to run away from their feelings, hide them away in the farthest corner of her soul, the more she felt that she needed Dennis like air. Without him, everything is gray, but with him, it's so easy and calm. The operation was hard, she had no idea. It was unclear what would happen next. Fader suddenly fell into a coma and was between life and death. Doctors honestly admitted that the chances of recovery were 50-50. But Dennis and Sveta believed that he would recover and every day they took turns being on duty at his bedside. They talked to him, read to him, told him how much they loved him. Three weeks passed and the man still did not come to his senses. Then Sveta took a risk and deceived the nursing staff, waiting for a moment when no one was in intensive care. She came to the old man's room with her son. She literally carried him through the sinuses. She whispered to him, Don't let me down, my darling. Be quiet. We're going to save Grandpa. And he seemed to understand. He didn't make. He didn't make a sound. Just sniffed to himself. The woman went into the room. She sat down on a chair and started talking. Hello, Fedor. We miss you a lot. Fedia, especially. Get well. Hurry up. We feel so bad without you. You're like a father to me. Dennis is exhausted. They say I've read that there's a bond between the person who gave birth and the baby. Let's check it out. She carefully put the baby next to Fedor. After all, you were the first to hold Fedia in your arms. You took Fadia in your arms. You gave him life. Listen to the song, my son, and I are singing for you at home. And we pray that you'll get well soon. And she sang softly a lullaby. And the baby echoed her. And in his own way, he hummed and sang along. And at the end, he babbled something that sounded like a grandfather's word. Sveta shrieked. Wow. Fadia called you grandfather. Do you hear? He loves you too. Wake up, please. You must, must live. And then the old man's eyelids fluttered open, and he began to try to move his fingers on his hand. All the readings on the monitor beeped and blinked. Sveta grabbed the baby, jumped out, out of the room and ran to the nurse on duty. Hurry, in the intensive care unit. Their fader seems to come to his senses. She hissed at her in horror. Oh, gave you permission to go in there with a the baby. You'll get me the hell fired. You've gone completely crazy. Come out into the hallway right now. All this time, Fyodor was as if, in a kind of enveloping viscous fog, he could not understand whether he was going to the next world or this one, to the other world or to this one. His Lena and Vanya seemed to be just around the corner and on the ground. Dinas is worried about him, and Sveta and her grandson are waiting. He could hear them calling his name, asking him to. He wanted to answer them, but somehow it was as if his body was not his. He tried to wake up, but his eyes would not open. To wake up, but his eyes wouldn't open. It was only when he heard Phidias cries, the same baby whom he had helped to give birth to, he knew exactly the answer. He must, must return to them. Who was going to, would help them. After all, it's so great when they call you grandpa. And to Lena, he will definitely. He'll come back to Lena when his time comes. At this very turning point, Fedor strained as hard as he could and tried to open his seemingly impossible eyelids again. Oh, miracle, he succeeded. 
At first, all the silhouettes were blurred, but then the image became clearer, and indeed, Fyodor opened his eyes with difficulty, and barely moved his lips trying to say, I love you too. Sveta was in the hallway sobbing and calling Dennis at work. Dennis, honey, your daddy woke up. We got it right. When he heard, he heard the baby crying. He came to his senses right away. Come quickly. The boy immediately got off work and rushed to the hospital. All the way in the bus, he prayed that his father would make it, get better, and come home as soon as possible. When Dennis entered the room, he saw that Fader was no longer connected to life support, and that a delegation of doctors were standing around him, checking for reactions. He rushed to his father, unable to control his feelings, and kissed him. Daddy, oh darling, you're awake. What a happiness. Now everything will be all right. We're, we feel so bad without you. Get well soon. Fyodor felt so warm and, and good, probably for the first time since the tragic deaths of his wife and Vanya. He wanted to live again. With a terrible strength, he was ready to fight the hateful disease, and he knew he would get better. Now life had meaning. Someone needed him. The retired man was madly grateful that that night. That night, Sveta had called his apartment. From that moment on, Fader's life changed abruptly. Everything had been turned upside down, and his life had returned to its original colors. First Sveta and the baby came into his life, and then his own son was found. The old man suddenly remembered the very dream when Lena had told him in a dream. You have someone to live for, only you don't know it yet, and it had turned out that way. So she knew that she would and wanted to keep him out of trouble, not to let him slide into the abyss completely and precipitously. The old man said quietly, Thank you, son, for everything. I know that you sold a good car to pay for the operation, and Svetochka so took care of me. You are all one big family to me now. You know what, son? Why don't you move in? Move in with me too. Just a room for everyone, and I'll be happy to have you around. What do you say? Dennis smiled. Thank you, Dad. I'm all for it. You know, I have become so attached to the baby and to Sveta that I can't imagine life without them anymore. Uh, I also like her a lot. I think I'm even in love with her. I'm just afraid to tell her. After all, she is the fiancée of my dead friend Oleg, and somehow I am embarrassed in front of him, even though he is dead. The man became serious and advised, I'll tell you this, son. Oleg is no longer. You can't lift him up. You can't live in the past. I too clung to it for a long time, tortured myself. I suffered and tormented myself. I drank and almost fell into the abyss. Listen to yourself and your heart. You're better off confessing to Sveta and getting rejected than worrying about something that may never happen. I think she likes you a lot too. She has a burning eye. Only she also, as well as you drive away these feelings. She is afraid to betray the memory of Oleg. Just tell her all what you feel, then you will know the truth for sure. In any case, you will feel better. Dennis hugged the old man. Thank you for your advice, Dad. How nice it is that we can have a heart-to-heart -heart talk like men. You know, every time I say the word Daddy and savor it. All my childhood I dreamed of my father. I missed him so much. But I want you to know that in spite of everything, I don't blame my mom for anything. What she did, of course. Terrible, no doubt. But she loved me completely sincerely. I felt it and always knew it. She tried to say something to me before she died, but didn't have time to say it. I only understood the phrase. Son, son, I'm so sorry to you. You forgive me. But I thought she was just delirious in her fever and didn't. I didn't pay any attention to them. And she apparently wanted to repent after all. But she went to heaven early. From that day on, Feder began to make a speedy recovery, and two weeks later he was brought home. Upon entering his apartment, he immediately noticed the changes. Sveta just fluttered about, 
Her eyes shone and shone with real happiness. She even looked so different and transformed. She had a fancy haircut, styled her hair differently, and her cheeks were flushed. The table was overflowing with of treats. Fedor, the head of the family, was seated in the middle, and they began to feed him with delicacies. Sveta and Dennis kept looking at each other slyly, but tried to pretend that they were just friends. It worked, to put it bluntly, not very well. Then Fitter couldn't stand it, laughed, and said, Why are we like children? I got it. You're together now. Why are you hiding? I'm very glad of it. Now we are one big friendly family. There's no greater reward for an old man. Love and advice. You? You're both worthy of it. Isn't that right, Granson? Oh, I'd like a glass of wine now. And two. To your health and mine. But you can't. I promised Lena. So, pour, Sveta, peach juice. And Fidia happily started humming and smiling like a little sun. Everyone felt so easy and good at heart. They matched each other perfectly, as if they had already. May everything go well with them. They deserved it.